Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, going to be a short discussion, about 30 minutes long, of uh, research uh, I've been doing uh, that investigates how the criminal justice system uh, is both a function of and contributes to uh, racial inequality and poverty in America. And what I'm going to try and do uh, over the next half hour is uh, summarize a large body of research, some of which I've been working on uh, over the last really 15 or, or 20 years. And uh, um, it's a large, uh, complex topic. And what I uh, want to do in the next 30 minutes is to draw out some stylized facts that uh, I hope can uh, inspire your imagination and also you know, try and make the case uh, for the fact that if you're interested in uh, the question of uh, poverty in America, if you're interested in the question of racial inequality in America, uh, you necessarily have to study uh, the criminal justice system as well and uh, take account of its facts. It is uh, a large social institution that's uh, emerged over the last 40 years uh, that's been extremely influential in structuring uh, the life chances in communities of colour uh, and among the poor in American society. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is share my screen for you and uh, I'm going to walk through a, a set of slides uh, and uh, uh, and then I'll return at the uh, conclusion. So let me share my screen and here are my slides. Punishment and inequality. Uh, and the, the motivating idea for research in this field is uh, the idea of mass incarceration. And I'll spend a, a little bit of time uh, talking uh, about what I mean by this idea of mass incarceration. What are the empirical markers uh, that we should uh, think about? And this is a term that's used to describe uh, the contemporary state, both the criminal justice policy in general, uh, but the deep influence of the penal system, prisons and jails in America, on the life chances of the most disadvantaged. Uh, and this was a project I worked on uh, for uh, a long time. Uh, uh, but ultimately, I felt I was running into limitations and uh, I needed to do uh, work of a very different kind. It was much more proximate to the people who are directly involved. And uh, I conducted a reentry study in Boston. And I want to talk uh, uh, a bit about uh, that study. I think it offers a different kind of picture into the empirical problem uh, of mass incarceration uh, and also raises methodological questions too. What's the appropriate scale of analysis? And then finally, uh, I'll turn to conclusions and implications. Okay, mass incarceration, uh, part one. When we talk about mass incarceration, we're talking about a term that was coined by the sociologist David Garland. And, and Garland uh, in, really invented this term uh, in uh, a piece in 2001. And he was thinking about the way in which American criminal justice policy had developed uh, until that point. And Garland said mass incarceration really involves two things. There are two uh, parts to this definition of mass incarceration. First, the scale of incarceration is comparatively and historically unusual. Very high level of uh, in incarceration by international standards, very high level of incarceration by historical standards. That's one uh, part of the definition. The second part of the definition, though, says that it is so socially concentrated, incarceration is so socially concentrated in a small segment of the population that in that segment, we're no longer incarcerating the entire population. 
uh, we're no longer incarcerating individuals, but we're incarcerating entire groups uh, in society. So let's start with this first part, part of the definition uh, that mass incarceration is uh, uh, comparatively and historically unusual. We measure the scale uh, of a penal system in a country with incarceration rate, and that is the number of people locked up uh, on uh, a given day. Uh, and it's normally measured uh, per 100,000 of the population. So if we look at uh, Western European countries, uh, other liberal democracies, uh, the incarceration rate in those countries, 2011, uh, it's about 100 per 100,000. Um, in Western Europe and other liberal, uh, liberal democracies like Australia, um, the incarceration rate is about 0.1 of 1% uh, of the population. What if we compare this to the United States? The magnitude of incarceration in the United States is very significantly large, about 100 per 100,000 in Western Europe, about 700 per 100,000 uh, in the United States. Uh, what about historically? What's happening uh, historically? We have very good data uh, that goes back uh, to the mid-1920s. And uh, if we think about the 50 years from uh, 1925 to the early 1970s, the imprisonment rate in the United States is about 100 per 100,000, about what it is uh, in Western Europe uh, today. Uh, but then in the early 1970s, the system began to grow and it grew every year uh, for about the next 35 years. Oops. And uh, so you can see that right now, it's gone down a little bit over the last 10 years, the incarceration rate, uh, but we're sitting atop of this plateau, right, in which uh, the level of incarceration uh, in the United States is about five times higher than its historic average. And so, we're in a very unusual period uh, right now with respect to criminal justice policy, and it's really only emerged in the last decade or so. What does this mean in terms of numbers? It means that there's uh, 1.6 million people in state or federal prison. That's not the entire incarcerated population because there's another 700,000 people in county jails, and most of these people are awaiting trial or awaiting court action. Um, that's not the entire correctional population because there's another 850,000 people who are back in their communities and they're meeting regularly with a parole officer and they're under the supervision uh, of a parole officer. That's not the entire community corrections population uh, because there's another 4 million people in the United States uh, on probation. So they've, for the most part, received non-custodial sentences, they're not, they haven't been uh, sent to prison, uh, but they're meeting regularly with a probation officer uh, in the community. And, and they're uh, vulnerable to being having their probation revoked, and in which case they would uh, be sent to prison. You add this all up, it's seven million people in the United States right now are under some sort of criminal justice uh, supervision. And that's uh, historically new. Now, as important as these figures are, that's not what's most important about incarceration in America. The most important thing about incarceration in America is its unequal distribution of the population. And we can see this uh, if we consider variation in incarceration by race and education. And everything I've shown you so far has been about incarceration rates, which are snapshots at a point in time. How many people are locked up on a given day? But we may be interested in a different type of statistic that measures the population's exposure to the penal system. We may be interested in the cumulative risk of incarceration. What is the likelihood you've ever been to prison by a certain age, by your mid-30s, uh, for example? And Becky Pettit and I uh, calculated these cumulative risks of imprisonment. So talking about the deep end of the system, uh, state or federal prison for a felony conviction, 12 months at the minimum, 27 months served, 
uh, time served uh, at the median. And we looked at a birth cohort that was born in the late 1940s, 45 to 49. So they're reaching their mid thirties, around about 1979, before the big explosion in, uh, in uh, prison and jail populations, right? And we looked at black and white men at three different levels of schooling, uh, whether they dropped out of high school, so they never completed uh, 12 years of schooling, uh, whether they uh, uh, finished high school but never went to college, the non-college fraction of the population, and then we looked at all black and white men. And if we look at this uh, post-war birth cohort, born 45 to 49, we estimated that if you dropped out of high school, uh, about 15% of black men uh, uh, would go to prison at some point in their lives or by the time they reach midlife uh, uh, in their mid-30s. If they never went to college, which is about half of all black men, it's about one in eight, a little over 12% of all black men, the lower half of the educational distribution, we estimate it, have been to state or federal prison at some point in their lives. So let's compare the experience of this group to another birth cohort that's born in the late 1970s. And they're reaching their mid thirties around uh, 2009. So they're growing up through the period of the American prison boom. For non-college black men, we estimate about 36%, over a third, 36% of non-college black men in this recent birth cohort uh, have been to prison. If they dropped out of high school, so the very bottom of the educational distribution uh, of black men, if they never finished high school, we estimate 70% have been to prison by their mid thirties. So within a generation, the experience of imprisonment has become pervasive in the lives of black men with very low levels of schooling. And this is historically novel. And this has happened at a time when crime rates are dropping to their lowest levels in 40 years. This is the product of policy change. So for me, as a student of poverty and inequality, the question is, what's the effect of this pervasive incarceration, particularly focused among African-American men with low levels uh, of schooling? And a, a huge research literature grew up uh, around this question. And uh, some of it was focused on labor markets. What are the uh, employment and earnings look like of people uh, who are coming out of prison? Some of it has focused on, on families. How do kids do whose parents have been uh, incarcerated? What, what's their well-being uh, look like? Uh, what are the effects on health and mortality? It's a large, complicated research literature. It's a hard scientific question. There's a lot of endogeneity uh, there because people at risk of incarceration uh, have poor life chances to uh, begin with. But if I could summarize this big complicated research literature in a single sentence, it would look something like this. Mass incarceration criminalized social problems related to racial inequality and poverty on a historically unprecedented scale. Now, some of these social problems related to racial inequality and poverty uh, concerned serious violence and the system uh, was uh, responding uh, to the social problem of uh, serious violence. But some of it too was uh, uh, also included things like homelessness, untreated mental illness, untreated addiction, all of these social problems were also swept up uh, by mass incarceration. Now, because there are a whole variety of negative social effects associated with incarceration, diminished earnings and employment, family breakup, uh, the diminished well-being of children, poor health, that was concentrated in a very disadvantaged fraction of the population, the effect of mass incarceration has been to contribute to the reproduction and racial inequality, both over the life course, uh, so people are 
uh, enduringly over their lives, stuck in the bottom rungs uh, of the social hierarchy and intergenerationally from one generation to the next because uh, of incarceration's negative effects on uh, families and children. A lot of this research was summarized in uh, a National Academy of Sciences report. And uh, the NAS report, uh, this came out in 2014, the NAS report concluded that given the small crime prevention effects of long prison sentences and the possibly high financial, social, and human costs of incarceration, federal and state policymakers should revise current criminal justice policies to significantly reduce the rate of incarceration in the United States. So the headline recommendation from the National Academy of Sciences is we have to reduce incarceration rates and get more into line with historical and comparative norms. Now, I was doing a lot of research in this area, looking at big social science data sets, so, uh, particularly on the effects of incarceration on labor market outcomes uh, and uh, on families, uh, uh, the well-being of children and uh, on family structure. Uh, and at the same time I, I was doing this work, uh, I was going into prison a lot. I was, uh, I was uh, teaching in prison and I was beginning to hear the stories of uh, people who are incarcerated. And, and those stories were often very much more complicated uh, than my data uh, was able to reveal. Uh, oftentimes, right, with this big demographic work, I was reducing people to uh, four variables, to age, sex, race, and education. And, and, and I, I worried that uh, the empirical analysis I was providing was too thin. It wasn't uh, reflecting the rich reality that I was learning about as I was going into prison. I also worried about undercoverage with these big social science uh, data sets, so a lot of uh, household survey data. Uh, people who are involved in the criminal justice system uh, are really very significantly uh, under enumerated. And, and these, uh, these survey methods aren't really designed to follow the dynamics of what happens to people. Uh, after they uh, after they come out of prison, and as a result of this uh, gap between the complexity of reality on the ground and the simplicity of these big data research materials, uh, I was looking at. I, I found that many of the really practical questions that policymakers uh, were raising: how do we uh, how do we improve employment uh, after? incarceration? Uh, how should we help our kids whose parents have been incarcerated? Really good common sense uh, policy questions that people were grappling with every day. The kinds of empirical materials I was dealing with uh, was providing little guidance. So this is the context for the re-entry study and uh, it was a very, very different kind of research uh, from uh, the type I was doing. And uh, the re-entry study took a very small cohort of people uh, coming out of prison in Massachusetts and who were returning to neighborhoods uh, in the Boston area. And the, uh, the only uh, criteria uh, to be included in the study was number one, you had to be returning to a neighborhood in the Boston area. And number two, you're within a week of release. So the first time we interviewed you was one week before you were released from prison and then we followed people uh, for a year to learn about their experiences. Um, this was a collaborative effort um, which uh, I was working with Anthony Braga, uh, uh, a criminologist at Northeastern and Rihanna Cole who ran the research unit for Department of Correction. We had amazing access uh, to the Massachusetts Department of Correction. I think we're in every single prison facility in that system, uh, except for one, and that means we're in pre-release centers, we're in uh, maximum security, 
uh, we were in solitary confinement units where we were you know, talking to people in non-contact units through plexiglass. Incredible access. We're in the state psychiatric hospital, which was run by the Department of Correction. Uh, uh, and and uh, that was uh, uh, that was largely with the assistance of uh, Rihanna's work on the project. Uh, so it, there's a longitudinal interview study. We're interviewing people intensively, 122 men and women released from Massachusetts, uh, returning to neighborhoods around Boston. Uh, and we collected a lot of data on things like employment, housing, health family life. These were the outcomes that had been the focus of this large research program on mass incarceration. There's a criminal justice population and so uh, the kinds of challenges that they're dealing with uh, are often uh, at least somewhat different uh, from those uh, faced by uh, low-income people in general. We also collected data uh, on drug use, cri uh, uh, criminal involvement, and contact with the criminal justice system. It's a big complicated data set. We interviewed people five times uh, in a year. There was a qualitative component as well uh, as a quantitative component. Um, if I could pick out three main findings uh, from these data, uh, they would be this. Uh, first, as we got to know people, they spoke to us a lot about the violence that they had seen in their lives. And, you know, some people had committed serious violence and that's why they were in state prison. Uh, nearly everyone in the sample had experienced uh, serious victimization or exposure to trauma. And this often started uh, very, very young in uh, early childhood in the family homes in which people uh, were growing up. So very high level of exposure to violence uh, and trauma in, in the data. Uh, second thing, people coming out of prison are in poor health. They're in uh, poor physical health, a lot of chronic conditions, uh, a, a lot of uh, chronic, uh, chronic disease. Um, some of it is diseases of, uh, of poverty. Uh, uh, like asthma and hypertension. Uh, some of it is uh, related to uh, sustained drug use, uh, uh, hepatitis, uh, arthritis, uh, which is uh, related to opioid use. Uh, people also uh, were in poor mental health and, and that meant uh, a lot of mood disorders. Uh, we observed uh, a lot of depression, uh, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, and some uh, serious mental illness, about 15% of the sample uh, had been diagnosed with uh, psychotic conditions um, uh, like uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder. Um, final thing, there is a very acute level of material hardship uh, in the year after incarceration. The average earnings of the, uh, the Boston uh, sample uh, was, uh, the, the average income, I'm sorry, was $6,000 in uh, the year after incarceration. The year, and in the year we're doing uh, our data collection, uh, $6,000 is about half of the federal poverty line for an individual uh, living alone. So people on average are living uh, at a level of deep poverty. There was no independent housing uh, at all in the sample uh, in the entire year after prison. This meant that people were either living with family, doubling up in uh, many cases, uh, or they were in uh, some sort of group quarters like a, a transitional housing program uh, or an in, inpatient treatment facility, uh, or they are street homeless. Um, so really acute uh, housing instability. Um, let me show you. Uh, let me show you a little bit uh, about what these data look like. Uh, so childhood trauma. We asked about things like uh, uh, problems of uh, addiction in the family in which you were growing up. 
were you hit by your pair action? High left, about half of the kids were uh, reported being hit by their parents. Incredibly, 40% of the sample had witnessed someone uh, being killed, which was a, just an unbelievable uh, exposure to uh, serious violence in childhood. About 40% of the sample, their parents had lost custody of them. Uh, uh, the uh, family members were often uh, victims of serious violence and themselves, high rate of uh, domestic violence, depression, suicidality. So a high level of trauma uh, in the re-entry study sample. Poor health, what does that look like? We came to call this frailty, human frailty, you know, sort of inspired by the, uh, the, uh, uh, the demographic language uh, around differential frailty. And uh, uh, very high level of substance use uh, in the sample, uh, high level of depression, 40, 50%. Uh, high level of chronic pain uh, in the sample. Uh, sometimes that was related to chronic conditions uh, like arthritis. Sometimes it was the residue of injuries that people had been su uh, had suffered if, uh, uh, if they'd been beat up or shot, uh, for instance. Lots of chronic, uh, uh, chronic disease, uh, about a quarter of the sample uh, reported to us that they were uh, heroin users, uh, high levels of anxiety, PTSD, and uh, about 15% reported to us that they had been diagnosed with a uh, psychotic condition. So uh, very poor health status uh, in the family. Now, the interesting thing is these two things were related. People who experienced the most trauma in childhood reported to us uh, the most health problems. Uh, if they were uh, abused as children, uh, then uh, their risk of poor health in adulthood was higher than we would even expect given their overall uh, level of exposure uh, to trauma. Now, the interesting thing is that poor health is related to material hardship after prison release. So if we look at three outcomes quickly, uh, Hard drug use. Are you are you uh, 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 using opioids, cocaine, methamphetamine uh, in the year after prison release? Among the frail, that fifty percent of the sample uh, in the poorest health, uh, they're much more likely uh, to be using hard drugs. Their housing situation much more unstable, unlikely to be in private households, more likely to be in uh, shelters, other group quarters, or street homeless. Uh, employment improved uh, over the course of the year after prison, uh, but the rate of joblessness was highest among people in poor health. So what do we, what do we make of uh, all of this research that thinks about our criminal justice systems not chiefly as crime control institutions, but part of the institutional landscape uh, of American poverty and racial inequality. Number one, clearly, incarceration is a function and a cause of poverty and racial inequality. We saw that in the statistics of in, uh, incarceration and in the research that observes uh, the negative effects of incarceration uh, on life chances. Poverty, what do we mean by when we talk about poverty? Poverty in this social setting is a multi-dimensional concept. It doesn't include only low income, uh, which is how the Census Bureau defines poverty, but it in embraces a whole variety uh, of hardships, some of them bodily hardships, right, experienced as poor health, uh, a whole variety of hardships that are very, very closely uh, connected to low income. I think uh, the, the poor health effects uh, of low income are, uh, are well understood. Uh, I want to underline for uh, the group of people I was uh, talking to, uh, the uh, uh, great exposure to trauma in the sample, I think, um, as a dimension uh, of 
the social problem of, of poverty, we've underestimated uh, the lifelong effects of exposure to trauma uh, in childhood, many of which begin uh, inside, uh, inside the family home. Racial inequality. The, so much of this story is about the inseparability uh, of racial inequality uh, from poverty. And it, it means at least two things in this context, racial inequality. First is that the patterns of inequality that we observe and the patterns of incarceration that we observed are spatially organised because race in America is spatially, uh, is spatially organised. Uh, segregation uh, creates pockets of uh, deep disadvantage uh, and you, you see that very clearly in patterns of incarceration. It's uh, uh, tremendously uh, spatially organised. Tiny neighbourhoods uh, uh, contribute uh, vast proportions of uh, the city's prison uh, admissions, for example. Rob Sampson, Jessica Symes have uh, worked on this problem. Second thing, though, and this is where I think uh, criminal justice institutions are unusual uh, on the landscape, the institutional landscape of uh, uh, American poverty and racial inequality. Criminal justice institutions confer stigma, the stigma of uh, official uh, criminal, uh, criminality. And I think they reinforce beliefs, practices, uh, other institutions that are premised on uh, uh, suspicion of black communities, uh, 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 an innate uh, propensity to criminality uh, in, uh, in black communities. This is part of the social construction of criminality uh, that uh, our courts and incarcerations uh, are implicated in, and, and we should think of this, uh, uh, this cultural project really, as uh, a dimension of the inequality that incarceration creates. Final thing, the last note that I want to end on. So what, what does reversing mass incarceration consist of? And we're in the middle now of a live debate and social mobilization. We're in a public negotiation uh, about uh, America's criminal justice project and its relationship to, to racial justice. So what does reversing mass incarceration mean? I think it means more, right, than simply returning to incarceration rates of the, uh, the 19, 1950s and, and shrinking our prisons so they're in line with international norms. Reversing mass incarceration, I think, involves a, a positive vision of justice, a positive vision of citizenship, uh, uh, particularly in low-income communities, particularly uh, in the black community, uh, in which uh, people have uh, some sort of access to their, uh, their full human capacity, their, uh, their, their full uh, potential, right? Sam talks about uh, uh, capacity as uh, an indispensable element of the social justice project. And I think that, that kind of language is very relevant here. And, and I think because of the way criminal justice institutions operate, they do confer a stigma of criminality, behavioural deviance, uh, uh, moral suspicion. Reversing mass incarceration will inevitably be part of, uh, will involve uh, a cultural project uh, in which uh, the humanity of people who have been swept up by the system uh, is affirmed and elevated. So thank you very much for the opportunity of talking to you uh, uh, about this project and uh, I hope this uh, presentation was useful to you. Thank you.